Hello, my name is Indigo Holcomb James, and I'm Strategic Research Lead at ACME, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image based in Melbourne. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon on this glorious day, even though we can't actually see it anymore, it is out there and it is beautiful. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting together on the lands of the Gadigal people, and I extend my respects to their elders past and present. To anyone of joining us online, I extend those same respects to the traditional custodians of the lands that you're on today too. Always was, always will be. This panel is called Automation and the Arts. With the recent and explosive public take up of generative AI tools and interfaces, artistic and cultural production is ever increasingly entangled with the politics, ethics and aesthetics of automation. We wanted this panel to really have the intention of starting a conversation. We wanted to pose a couple of questions to start that conversation and they are, where is automation taking place in the arts? What is it being used for? Where is it not taking place and why? To get into addressing these questions, I'm really delighted to be joined by my colleagues and panelists, Dr. Joel Stern and Amalia Lindo. Joel is a researcher, curator and artist a Vice Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Fellow in the RMIT School of Media and Communication and an Associate Investigator at ADMS. Joel's work focuses on how social, political and technical practices of sound and listening inform and shape our contemporary worlds. Amalia is a multidisciplinary artist and a PhD candidate at Monash Art Design and Architecture. Her work incorporates human and algorithmic decision making into the practice of filmmaking to examine how automated te uh, dis technologies displace human labour. And as I've already mentioned, I'm Indigo. I now work for ACME, but prior to that, I was an ADMS research fellow in the RMIT node, where I focused on questions of digital transformation and inequality with a particular interest in creative in industries and cultural institutions. In our preparations for this conversation, we talked a lot about the slipperiness of automation. One of the very many benefits of being connected with ADMS is getting real insight into the practical, hands-on and theoretical expertise in and around automation, as has been so clearly demonstrated over the last couple of days. I think particularly cogent for this panel uh, is this morning's session on generative AI and LLMs uh, and yesterday's talks on automated content curation in video services. Our panel is coming at these questions from slightly different perspectives. Uh, from individuals as artists and arts workers and with varying degrees of connection and engagement with the academy. We really wanted to foreground these areas of expertise and to frame our contributions to this symposium in light of these orientations and modes of engagement with the intention of maybe opening some space for further collaborations in these domains and with these methods. Accordingly, we're each going to talk for seven to 10 ish minutes before we open up to a broader conversation. I'll be keeping an eye on Slido, so please add your questions throughout and we'll get through as many as possible. Uh, Joel, I'd love to invite you to start. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Indigo. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do for the next few minutes um, is just quickly survey some recent conversations, interventions, and ideas circulating in contemporary art, music and creative writing around new forms of automation, particularly in relation to generative AI. And I hope this um, <coughs> helps kind of set the scene um, for Amalia's hugely interesting artwork and the important questions that it raises. Um, as a bit of a disclaimer, this is obviously an extremely partial list. Um, they're references that have caught my eye, I guess, as a curatorial researcher. And as I understand curatorial research, it's about embracing the task of assembling ideas, objects and practices in unconventional and experimental ways. And art provides a very permissive stage for such endeavours. Um, therefore, I'm granting myself permission to explore this discourse in quite a messy manner. Um, you'll notice I listed art and music and writing earlier as if they're easily distinguishable ca categories or modalities. Um, although many artists do not see them as separate entities, and I'm guessing Amalia is in that category, um, medium specificity as a notion um, has become somewhat outdated. And in the context of AI, um, considering all these elements as data somewhat equalises them too. 
However, one of the notable things I've observed about generative AI applications like ChatGPT for text, MidJourney for images, Music LM, and, and similar applications for sound is how they blur the distinction between these traditional categories while simultaneously reconstituting them. So even though everything is the product of a text prompt, um, what comes out the other end is either an image or a sound or more text. Um, and that tension and slippage is one of the reasons why I liked science fiction writer Ted Chang's description uh, in The New Yorker of ChatGPT as a blurry JPEG of the internet, a compressed and pixelated Xerox copy of the original. Um, Chang's take was rather pessimistic on the, right, on the possibility of using the system as a writing tool, he states, obviously no one can speak for all writers, but let me make the argument that starting with a blurry copy of unoriginal work isn't a good way to create original work. If you're a writer, you will write a lot of unoriginal work before you write something original. And the time and effort expanded on that unoriginal work isn't wasted. On the contrary, um, it's precisely what enables you to eventually create something original. On the other side of the equation, you have someone like Kay Allado McDowell, whose book Pharmaco AI was written in conversation with a GPT-3 engine fed with a selection of mystical and psychedelic texts uh, and composed in a process described as akin to a long-form musical improvisation. Bruce Sterling described this book as reading like a Gnostic's Uja board powered by atomic kaleidoscopes. These two examples are already paradigmatic of the tension between, on the one hand, the resistance to these tools in the name of human originality, authorship, labour and fidelity, and the embrace of the same tools in the pursuit of more experimental, distributed, maybe cybernetic pr production approaches on the other. Partially in response to uh, Chang and his characterization of ChatGPT as a semantic poor image, artist and theoretician Hito Stale coined the term mean images in this New Left Review essay to describe the outputs produced by applications like Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion. The image you see was produced by entering her own name as the prompt, and Stale described it as unflattering. Mean images, she writes, converge around the average, the median, hallucinated mediocrity. They represent the norm by signaling the mean. They replace likenesses with likelinesses. They may be poor images in terms of resolution, but in style and substance, they are mean images. They are documentary expressions of society's view of itself, seized through the chaotic capture and large-scale kidnapping of data. Staying with the theme of data power, capture and scale, I want to draw attention to Have I Been Trained, a project created by the organisation Spawning who develop tools for artists to gain agency over their training data, allowing them to opt into or opt out of the training of large AI models, set permissions on how their style and likeness is used, and offer their own models to the public. The site allows you to, to search large image data sets to see if your own images have been used, and to request their removal, if you desire, a kind of data repatriation or rescue. Staying with the theme of, um, I'll, I'll keep going with this dialectic sort of play between opting out, opting in, hijacking and reorienting um, by mentioning this work by Sam Levine and Tiga Brain um, who deploy a kind of counter logic of data mining and manipulation in subversive ways. Um, for instance, in this work, Synthetic Messenger, Levine and Brain created bots that scan major media sites for articles on climate emergency and climate activism and automatically click repeatedly on the advertisements, therefore giving the articles more algorithmic prominence and visibility as the sites favour the content that is most profitable to advertisers. Um, and I wanted to share this work especially as it intersects quite directly with some of the other presentations at the symposium um, around the Ad Observatory, for instance, and um, the recommender systems that that were discussed here yesterday. Um, okay, just a couple more examples focused on sound and music before I hand over to Amalia. Um, 
Uh, many people will be familiar with um, this recent story of so-called Fake Drake, um, where a song using AI-generated vocals purporting to be a collaboration between the popular artists um, Drake and The Weeknd went viral on streaming platforms um, and then was quickly removed by Universal Music Group, who said the song had infringing content created with generative AI. And this brought up a lot of interesting questions about what is fake and what is real. Is an algorithmic simulation of a known voice fake or is it something new, weird and real on its own terms? And what about the rest of the song, the melodies and the instrumentation? What about the fact that many fans loved the song and didn't care how it was produced, that some commented they preferred fake Drake to the real thing? Amidst this controversy, the artist Grimes declared on Twitter that she would make her own voice available to whoever wanted to use it and that the music could be uploaded to any streaming platform under the moniker Grimes AI One and that any royalties that would come from the music, which she would be able to track because of the way her audio, audio files are coded, she claimed, uh, would be split equally down the middle. All these examples for me demonstrate how art, with its constant feedback loops between theory and practice, is an important site to observe emerging technologies being contested and deployed. And I'll end um, this very rapid survey with a work by artists Joel Spring and Jazz Money titled Wiradjuri AI, Lessons in How Not to Be Heard. The work was commissioned um, by me and some collaborators as part of our project Machine Listening. And in the work, the two artists discuss the technopolitics of visibility, capture, recognition, language and culture and speculate on the possibility of a Wiradjuri AI, while at the same time we see an overlay of real-time statistical data for things like emotion recognition and speech-to-text transcriptions. And what I like about this work is the way it sits with the entanglement and undecidability of how to interface with these technologies, the way they are operating on you even as you reject them, and the contradictions of trying to conceptualise a decolonial AI. So with that, I'm going to segue over to Amalia now. And um, I'll just mention that, you know, when Indigo and I were um, discussing all these ideas and putting together this panel proposal, um, I kind of fortuitously um, took a walk through the Melbourne Now exhibition at the NGV um, and encountered Amalia's work, Telltale Economies of Time, and immediately sent some photos and <laughs> messages to Indigo um, saying that we have to invite Amalia to join us. So. I'm super excited to hand over to her and hear more about the project. Um, thanks, Indigo and Joel. That's a really nice introduction. <laughs> um, so the image you can see here is um, my work in the Melbourne Now exhibition, as, as Joel mentioned, um, titled Telltale Economies of Time. Um, and at the end of 2021, I was generously commissioned by the NGV to make this 12-channel video work. Um, it's an expansion on a previous project that I had made for the art fair in 2021 called um, The Clouders of the Earth, which was also an exploration into the human intelligence behind AI and used the Mechanical Turk platform as a site of investigation. Um, if you haven't heard of Mechanical Turk before, it is Amazon's platform-based labor market where contractors known as requesters hire globally dispersed and, importantly, anonymous human workers to, com to complete what they call um, human intelligence tasks or HITs for short. Um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk takes its name from a wooden chess-playing automaton which was invented by a Hungarian inventor named Wolfgang von Kemplin in the 18th century. Kemplin's automaton exhibited a human level intelligence for the game of chess. However, the automaton was eventually revealed to be operated by a human who was very uncomfortably concealed in a small cabinet beneath the chessboard. Um, inspired by Kemplin's hoax, Amazon launched the MTech platform in 2005 Contractors use MTurk to recruit human workers remotely to complete um, repetitive micro-tasks that algorithms are currently unable to automate. 
tech companies and developers on the MTech platform are able to uphold an illusion of autonomous intelligent machines by concealing human labor. Um, further workers on the platform are identified only as a 14 character alphanumeric string, which kind of further perpetuates that illusion, I think. As a former worker myself, I witnessed how companies relied on human workers' creativity and decision making to generate trading models used to power apps and websites. Um, for the Telltale Economies of Time project, I operated as a requester. So as I said before, that's um, someone who um, provides a task for people to complete. What interested me about my role as a requester in this instant were the parallels between prompt engineering um, and instruction-based art that characterized the conceptual art movement of the mid to late 1960s, which we've discussed a little bit as a panel. Um, in conceptual art, the prompt takes the form of an instruction, procedure, or system given by the artist for anyone to use to create a work of art. Not dissimilar to how we provide a prompt to generative AI systems to produce an image. In both cases, the idea itself becomes the artwork, which is a concept that has been really formative for me. While the task I posed was creative in nature, it still required effective communication on my part so that each worker particip Sorry. participating in this project understood the procedures involved in their contribution to this um, large-scale work. So from March 2022 until March 2023, I tasked roughly 1,800 human workers on Mechanical Tech with the task of responding to the video submitted by the worker who completed the task before them. So essentially each worker was um, required to provide the next scene in the film so it became a kind of chain mail narrative or um, exquisite corpse if you know that game. Um, the exquisite corpse was a surrealist game which we would know, but <laughs> where each participant takes a turn writing or drawing on a sheet of paper, folds it, and then gives it to the next person, and it becomes a collective um, or collaborative outcome. So at the end of each calendar month, the videos in the project are compiled according to the order generated by workers through their video-based responses. A large part of my role as the artist or director of the project was cleaning the collected video information to ensure that um, the videos weren't in breach of copyright or any other applied parameters. At the end of the collection process, the project resulted in a collectively produced six hour and 36 minute video work made by people in over 30 countries around the world. And I've compiled it into um, a single channel video, which maybe I can play for a minute. I don't know. <laughs> generating training data for AI influenced how they interpreted the task. They tended to um, replicate the most obvious action or object within the video they were responding to, which generated quite a lot of um, feedback loops from month to month. And if you watch each channel individually, it happens um, really regularly, actually. The soundtrack for the work, which was designed by Dean Shrika, uh, who's a PhD researcher at the University of Melbourne and a data scientist at CSIRO, was algorithmically produced and involved layering the original audio based on movement and subject matter. 
The audio was broken down into um, small manipulatable segments called grains that were transformed in various ways, such as stretching, delaying, or rearranging. The raw audio, raw audio from the videos was then fed into a th synthesizer and modified based on values generated by motion detection and color mapping algorithms. And the resulting soundtrack, um, which you heard very briefly, is a dynamic abstract soundscape that rep re uh, sorry, resembles tuning into various radio frequencies that feature the sounds of everyday life, layered based on the movement and subject matter of the videos. Within the installation, the sound is panned um, around the structure into 12 channels, and it generates a, an immersive sonic experience for the viewer, in my opinion. Um, my, my intention for the work was to um, showcase the important role we as humans play in the development of artificial intelligence, whether as paid laborers or as unpaid internet users. For me, the production and results generated by this work have highlighted how we, as users of um, automated technologies, can also become kind of automated to some extent by mirroring the behaviors that are perpetuated by algorithms. And because all the workers who participated in the work um, are anonymous, even to me as the artist, this project attempts to detach workers from their representation on the MTurk platform as software or lines of code rather than human beings. And so through the collaborative nature of the project, workers were also able to engage creatively with um, scenes and narratives submitted by other human workers around the world and returned a kind of sociality to a form of digital work, which is um, highly isolating, usually. And I think I'll pass to Indigo. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amalia. Um, and I think in question time, it'd be really great to pick up a little bit on uh, the kind of institutional framing of that work as well. So we're just marking that one for later. Um, so I'm going to turn away a little bit from arts practice specifically and towards the role of institutions. Um, and I always feel a little bit boring coming after Joel and Amalia, so I apologise in advance for that. Uh, but I wanted to frame my contribution today in two kind of halves. So the first, detailing a few insights into questions of automation in the context of institutions, uh, drawing on my empirical research that I did during and preceding my time at ADMS. In the second half, I want to really talk through um, some insights from the perspective of my new role at ACME, and I want to talk about what we're using automation for uh, in that workplace and think through what this organisational or institutional kind of viewpoint can tell us or maybe point us towards. And in that aspect, I'm really especially interested in teasing out why I think arts and cultural institutions offer particularly generative sites for research around these topics that might be of interest to the ADMS community. So first of all, to uh, my research at ADMS. My work here really expanded out from my PhD, which focused on questions of digital inequality uh, in arts and cultural organisations. And out of that work, I want to pull on three threads. So the first one is that I started my PhD in 2016 and research partner recruitment was particularly challenging at that time. I was often met with a response that organisations, cultural organisations like museums and arts galleries kind of knew what they were doing with digital, that it wasn't that difficult, that most people around them had mobile phones, right? It's kind of fine. Uh, and eventually the research partners that I ended up working with were organisations and people who were working with uh, stark digital inequality. So I ended up working with an organisation who uh, did cultural catalog uh, collect cataloging of cultural collections with older adults and organizations that were working with remote First Nations artists. Digital inequality for these organizations was a really live and present question. And what I found out of that research was that digital inequality had a profound impact on who did digital work in those organizations, who the digital work was intended for, and what the digital work could ultimately enable. I finished my PhD in late 2019 and then like six months later COVID hit and I was extremely interested in understanding what all those organisations who three years ago had told me that they were fine and knew how to do digital work, how they were actually coping with this kind of massive and rapid transition uh, to online operations solely. 
And so I started this, what was supposed to be a very tiny and little baby pilot project, but that quickly kind of spiraled out into a two year project working with 70 institutions across the country uh, from artist run initiatives through to state and national run organizations. And the research revealed some pretty clear patterns. So in the same way that we see digital inequality at the individual level playing out along dynamics that are driven by and that compound existing inequalities, we see arts and cultural organisations that are smaller and non-metropolitan, that receive less funding, typically also experiencing digital disadvantage when compared to their larger metropolitan counterparts. It's of course not quite that simple or straightforward. Small to medium organisations that are valued and invested in digital over a long time can be more nimble and more transformative than larger organisations that have not done that work already. Um, I often think about a research participant who worked in a state-owned capital A arts organisation who even after two years of enforced digital delivery really firmly told me that their organisational priorities remained squarely focused on art on walls and physical uh, reception of that. And so that second thread that I want to mark here is the empirical demonstration of how unevenly distributed digital capabilities of arts and cultural organisations are. The third thing that comes out of that research, I think, is the almost absence of automation. As an ADMS postdoc, this was a pretty key concern for me, but it was really difficult to align with the work that I was doing. Uh, automation, as we've already discussed, is a conceptually and a practically tricky thing to nail down. And in contexts where digital inequality is dominant, the literacy is required of participants to actually uh, understand and identify automation even when it's in place was often not quite there. So participants might come at it from slightly sideways angles. And I'm thinking here about a participant who worked for a university gallery and had led the redevelopment of their website and to get around university restrictions on site ownership that we might all be slightly aware of, they'd essentially set up the design of the website to, to overlay the university's one. So it existed as a kind of frame over the top. It was initially a win, it looked much better than the normal university website, definitely looked like an art institution instead of a university. But it was swiftly revealed to be pretty problematic in terms of its interaction with automated systems. So because of the overlaid nature of the website, it wasn't able to be indexed by search engines. And so the gallery was essentially unfindable. I pulled this example out because I think it speaks to several critical pieces here. It illuminates the influence uh, of digital literacies of staff members on organisational digital outcomes. And I think it highlights also the intersection of a lack of automation literacy uh, in these contexts, understanding where and how automation is taking place and where and how decision making, such as how a website might be redeveloped, feeds into automated outcomes. So that's the kind of first half. Second half now, I want to talk through the work that we're doing at ACME. Uh, and I think bouncing off the, the conversations that we've already had so far, we work with artists who are exploring this these topics, this work. If you haven't been yet, Gallery 2, we just opened a great new show by Memo Acton. It's called Distributed Consciousness, and it is exploring AI and generative media and what we want to do about platform economies. Uh, but I don't want to talk about artists exactly here. I want to talk about what arts organisations are doing with automation. So I work in a department called Experience Digital and Insights, and we bring together a pretty diverse team. We've got creative technologists, user experience designers, our memberships and ticketing team, and myself. And we work across the museum in a really horizontal and purposeful way. We don't work uh, vertically. We work across teams and across projects. Um, and so I think we're really unique in that way. And so I don't think this is necessarily findable, but I do think it points at uh, generalizable, sorry. But I do think it points us to some interesting dynamics of how automation is being used here. So in the context of us as a collecting institution, automation is fundamentally changing the assumptions that we had made about our work and our capabilities. Uh, a good example of this is in our collections team. So we're a museum of screen culture. We hold a truly enormous quantity of video content. Uh, one of the key issues with video content is making it accessible, both in terms of literal access, but also in terms of its legibility. Sorting through it is extraordinarily time consuming, understanding what's included within it and why it might be interesting to our audiences generally, or to a researcher or a creative practitioner specifically, used to require a collections officer to literally consume that content in very near real time. If you were lucky, you might have some metadata to point you towards a particular batch of content, but it's still a deeply time consuming process that was often in our case thwarted by the fact that we hold a huge amount of amateur videos and have very little uh, metadata associated with it. 
the process can get sped up with transcripts, right? If you've got a transcript of video content, you can move to text-based searching. This is a huge step forward, but as many of us know, transcription is time consuming and costly if you're working with humans. If you're working with something like Temi or Otter, it's cheaper and faster, but it's still a bit shit and you have to spend a lot of time fixing it. Uh, but in the last couple of years, massive transformation in this technology, right? In the past year, we've been experimenting with using, using OpenAI's Whisper tool to transcribe our video collections at scale. The transcription now provides a full uh, text of, is that gonna work? No, next one, okay. Uh, so we now have full transcription of our videos, but it also timestamps it with a start and end time code in seconds. This is a game changer for us. Uh, in terms of discoverability. Once we had all our digitized videos transcribed, our creative technologists began work on prototyping a way to search the collections. Um, and I'm just gonna play this. Um, the sound is gonna be terrible. I'm really sorry I recorded this on my laptop last night. Uh, but you can see here, we've got this uh, search inside feature that I'm about to click on. Look, I demonstrated that very nicely for you, I feel. Uh, and so now we can search for the ideas within the content. So Rage, I have picked because it pulls out. A wild storm of rage. And it jumps directly to where the, the video says it. So there's that. It's not quite right here, like it's pulling out averages as Rage there. Uh, but. And he's always at a rage. Next one. Head, and then, but I also just want to show you this one because it also picks up singing, which I think is really cool. So this is a video from the Wharfies, A History of Waterside Workers Federation. They may blast the scream and rage. Stunning. So, okay, we can stop that now. Excellent. Uh, so this like changes what we can do with our collections. It enables not just access, but discovery, and it's now possible to search for the ideas in those videos. We're continuing to experiment with machine learning tools, and we've started prototyping object and action classifications of our videos, which would allow us to add uh, video uh, filters to our video searches, as well as cataloging films in our collection in the similar ways that don't have any audio. So automation here is fundamentally changing the assumptions around how we work and what we can do with our collection items. It totally shifts how we think about what we, what we have and the stories that we can tell from them. But I think this is a really useful example for this audience because it points to how questions of automation in the context of platforms and perhaps more obviously news and media contexts are also playing out in cultural institutions and that also require our concerted attention. The, discovery, the discoverability and distribution of our cultural heritage is being automated, and this automation is playing out unevenly. Not all organisations are lucky to have a team of creative technologists in-house who can build and manufacture this kind of stuff. So for me, this loops us back to considerations of digital inequity. Who, where and how we automate the arts are political questions with profound consequences. Okay, so that's, that's my little contribution. And Having worked across where automation is taking place in artistic domains, discussed how the integration of automation and arts practice, among other things, opens questions around how and where we do this work and what kind of uh, illuminations of labour this works through, and considered some institutional and sectoral dynamics, we'll now turn to questions. So please do put your comments and, and questions into Slido. Um, but Joel, I'll hand over to you to set the scene a bit. Um, we just wanted to get a head start on the Q&A by posing some questions t to ourselves. <laughs> like, uh, you know, um, they're not exactly questions we w want to be asked, but I thought, um, you know, we'll also think of them as questions posed to you um, as, as not just an audience, but our, you know, um, peers and colleagues. Um, and you obviously can formulate a question you, you want to ask us, or if you want to respond um, to one of these questions which have informed our conversation, um, you can too. So, um, you know, one is how might institutions like universities better address how artists are working with these technologies, um, you know, with what ethical, and by ethical we also mean political, aesthetic, social um, frameworks, um, can that take place? And that's a really important question in relation to Amalia's work, which, you know, I think we should 
um, get into, which is um, the two different ethical frameworks um, that um, your work encountered, um, firstly at Monash University, where you um, undertaking the work as part of PhD research, and then at the NGV, where the work was exhibited. Um, so in one case, the work could be shown, in the other one, it was so sort of blocked in a certain sense. Um, and another question, um, if there was an art and automation platform at ADMS, you know, which um, a lot of us have been thinking about and would like to see happen, um, what would that look like? What should it ask, investigate and explore? Um, if people have thoughts on that, that would be super um, interesting. And then um, how do you think about the value and role of art in relation to your own um, disciplines, assuming that um, many of you here are coming from other disciplinary contexts and um, what does art do in these contexts? And um, I ask that partly because art has come up a few times in, in the symposium in the context of other panels and discussions, but often in rather sort of instrumental ways like, um, you know, in the context of branding or advertising or in the context of, um, you know, messaging and communication. But, um, you know, is, um, other, is there a role and value for art that goes beyond its in instrumentalization by other disciplines? Well, I think there is, but not to answer the question myself. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. Um, Maybe can we throw to Amalia first to just talk through the PhD and GV kind of sure. dynamics of the yeah. work. Is that all right? Um, yeah, so the Telltale work was um, funded by um, NGV and then also formed a part of my PhD research. Um, and I'd already started the project and had several times asked about um, eth ethics um, and needing ethics approval from the university in order to work with humans. Um, and because of the nature of the work, they had said several times that they didn't think that was necessary. Um, but because there are humans pictured in the work, when it went finally to ethics, they were very concerned about um, me picturing humans in the videos and weren't uh, going to allow me to make the work in the way that I had intended to. Um, and then NGV was very different. Um, they were very open-minded about how the work was made. And I didn't come across any questions from them about, um, there was ethical questions, definitely. We did talk about that, but um, not around the use of humans or picturing um, people in the videos, which I thought was really interesting considering that they're both quite large institutions and they're both somewhat liable for the work that's produced. Um, yes. <laughs> so in terms of the, yeah, the Monash, um, I had to change the parameters of that work and modify it so that I could use it as part of my research. It's so interesting, I think, the, the different institutional approaches to that work um, and, and kind of speaks to where we're able to do this research, where we're not able to do this research and what kind of considerations and um, organisational load bearing comes along with that as well. Joel, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I mean, I've, yeah, it's super interesting that these, that these two institutions um, in their different responses to the work um, obviously show um, how contested the question of ethics in relation to this sort of practice is. Um, but also um, show how often art is um, not a fixed category of practice, but a strategic staging post for the kind of work um, that can be done in the space of art institutions, but perhaps not in other kinds of spaces, um, because the methodologies are experimental, um, because um, the work is able to sit within co contradiction and uncertainty um, in certain ways, and also um, because the so much emphasis is given over to um, debates that happen in the space of reception and criticism, um, and it's sort of understood that it's in that space of reception where some of the ethical issues will be fleshed out rather than um, at the point of production. Yeah, I think a really interesting thing we encountered, my supervisor and I, was um, in doing the ethics approval that 
the videos that I had, they, there was no way for me to define them in any other way other than by saying data. And we weren't thinking about them as data. They're not data to me. They're, it's, you know, it's information. I guess it is data. But the way that the forms were laid out were always based around social science or the sciences in some way. And so they quantified all of that using data as the terminology. And I think um, that's really problematic when it comes to art because, you know, our methodologies don't necessarily involve data in that, in that way. And there wasn't really any way for me to answer the questions that they were asking me without defining it in their terms. Mm. Thanks. There's a couple of questions coming through around the like logistics, I suppose, of this work, Amalia, as well. And I wondered if you could talk through um, both the compensation and the attribution kind of processes that you went through thinking about uh, the acknowledging the workers' contributions to the work as well, uh, both financially and kind of as, as authors or performers of the work? Good question. <laughs> um, well, because they were anonymous, there was no way for me to, um, I, I, ca I can't <laughs> acknowledge their names. So um, they, they had to complete a consent form which told them what the work was for and how it would be presented. So it was, I was very open about, um, you know, how their, their images would be displayed. Um, in terms of compensation, I think that was kind of an interesting ethical point for me because I was given a particular budget and so I used that budget accordingly and it ultimately meant that the, the data reflected how much I paid each person. So there's a lot of countries that wouldn't participate because the fee might have been too low for them. Um, and so it, it did skew it quite a lot if we're using the word data. Um, yeah, so I think that was kind of problematic. And if I was to make the work in another way, I think I would probably um, consider like what, what that means for the outcome as well, because a lot of the participants were largely from um, India and Brazil. So. And the work, um, the payment had to be um, brokered through the Amazon system, is that right? Yeah, so you pay a 20% fee to Amazon um, every time a worker submits a film. So, yeah, there's no way around that. <laughs> but I think that's, on the one hand, um, problematic and a limitation of the work, and on the other hand, um, paradigmatic of the process which you are being very transparent about like also the an anonymity of the contributors um, if the university is trying to go down a path where where you're forced to expose and name those contributors then it undermines um, the way in which the work is actually um, you know highlighting and um, presenting a, s a structure and a system of labour, an economy of labour that is already in operation. Kind of picking up on that, we've got a question from Libby Young asking how you both think about your creative practices when they seek to both critique and use a technology at once. How do you resist a tool that you use? That's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really, it's a hard thing. I think we talked about this yesterday, actually, and Joel made a really good point about um, contradictions. Maybe, Joel, you said that really well. Maybe it's better you answer. Um, I think a lot of um, artists and creative workers labour under contradictions <laughs> and um, proceed through them and, you know, proceed very dialectically in their work. And so it's okay to be interested in things that you find kind of appalling and to be sort of fascinated by things that trouble you um, and to want to um, have also embodied experiences of um, working with those systems. Um, and I think, you know, I, I've in the machine listening project um, that I've been working on for a number of years, I've both, you know, um, a big part of the project is critiquing machine listening as a new form of surveillance capitalism, as the um, intrusive extraction of audio data, um, you know, for, for profit and um, etc. And then another part of 
the project um, is thinking about um, the experimental possibilities of uh, human machine listening collaborations, um, artists working with their own voice clones and reproducing them, um, you know, th thinking about um, the possibilities for environmental listening and computational bioacoustics and ecoacoustics. So it's um, the undecidability of and contradictions of these technologies um, can't be resolved easily, but I think artistic methodologies offer a way to move through that uncertainty um, in illuminating ways and often with unforeseen implications. I would agree with that, yeah. I think I felt that way about using Mechanical Turk or, you know, paying Amazon every time I, I collected a film. Um, but for me, I mean, I, w I worked on the platform previously as a worker, so I was, I was trying to approach it from both sides and understand um, how it worked. And I think it's, I mean, I don't see the work really as a critique, but more as a way of opening up a conversation about what that platform is and how it operates. Um, and I think it, for me it's really important not to project a particular opinion about um, my own view on the platform or on my own work and rather leave it open for other people to decide for themselves. I'm getting used to it. I think there's also something in it, this is a very half formed thought, but we all work for or work with universities that are deeply problematic institutions in and of themselves, right? Like we are actively implicated, implicated by these systems as well. So I don't know, that I think is, is a thing that we need to acknowledge as well. Um, a question here from Dan on the earlier session on LLMs, someone described generative AI as a new kind of paintbrush. Do you folks think this kind of framing is useful? Why or why not? I think we've been talking about the role of authorship and, and technology a lot in the prep of this, for this um, conversation. And, and I think some of the coverage of these tools is like the democratization of creativity, right? Like everyone's all of a sudden an artist able to make these things. But if I jump on mid journey, the stuff that I create is so ugly. Like I cannot, create anything good. I am not a skilled prompt engineer. Like that is still a process and a kind of creative ownership and authorship that I think is still there. So um, maybe I think I might agree with that. We talked, Joel, a little bit around the role of photography and like the kind of analogues there. Do you want to expand about that? Um, I mean, I'm suspicious of um, the claim that it's a, a new kind of paintbrush, um, you know, partly because there are a lot of assumptions in that statement about like what even is a paintbrush, you know, used used for and like um, is it just to make re Renaissance paintings or, you know, is it for painting ha houses or is it like for good art or bad art or amateur or professional art and, you know, I think um, it's coded as, um, a cr you know, a creative tool um a paintbrush is a creative tool and um yes w one of the ways that um it's possible to use generative ais as a creative tool and lots of artists will be incorporating those sorts of methods um into their practices you know i mean but lot but artists will only be a, i think a, a tiny um subset of the people using these tools um, and as everyone's pointed out in every pa panel these tools have implications for every discipline every sector every industry and I think what I'd possibly be worried about is um, the art washing dimension of over emphasizing um, the extent to which these tools are coded as creative and artistic um, when they are actually often you know proprietary and sort of extractive um and then from a cur curatorial perspective like as someone who's looking at art and making exhibitions um what i would be looking for um from artists who work with generative ai is um you know 
works that push the system into spaces that are really weird, uncanny, broken, um, that sort of push the logic of simulation and reproduction um, much further into um, sort of territories where you um, are not dealing with conventional notions of beauty, like you were saying you created something ugly, but I kind of don't care about those regimes of value of like, this is ugly, this is beautiful, it's we or interesting, right? But even like um, something radically boring could be of interest um, if it reveals, um, if it kind of like illuminates the process and the kind of underlying structures in a way that um, helps you understand the relationship between the medium and the technology and the output. Um, so yeah, I'd be looking for practices that make AI strange again, rather than sort of normative or homogenous um, and that kind of alienate it from itself in order for us to see more clearly what it is. Do you have any thoughts, Amalia? Um, another question from Dan Angus uh, kind of teases out some of those ideas around where we see the line between art and cultural product. Would you say that much of what is discussed or positioned as AI art isn't actually art at all? Which I think kind of leans back on some of your earlier comments, Joel, around the real instrumentalization of AI generated art. Um, I thought the opening keynote to yesterday was amazing, but there was a small kind of throwaway comment of, we don't know how to visualize machine learning, so we work with illustrators, which is interesting and very useful, but also like, what is the role for art for doing more than just explaining a key concept for a computer scientist? Like there, there is something more there. Um, did you both want to add anything to that? Can you repeat the question, sorry? Yeah, where's the line between art and cultural product? Would you say that much of what is discussed or positioned as AI art isn't actually art at all? <laughs> um, gosh, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I think, um, I don't think AI art is an art. I mean, I think, I do think that it's complicated to consider it a tool, as you sort of said before. It's... I mean, they've said it many times at the conference that, you know, generative AI is, it embodies, you know, humanity. It's, it's all about the humans. So there's so much more to it than that. Um, so I think there is something in it that, it, you know, it can be used in novel and interesting ways. Um, and, I'm, and I think people are doing that. Um, but I think, as Joel said, it, it, you'd have to do something pretty different with it for, for me to consider it um, an interesting artwork personally. I think putting in a prompt and creating an image in Dali isn't enough, <laughs> personally. I mean, another way to um, answer that also is to say that there, there isn't really such a thing as art. There's just cu cultural production and art is, in a way, kind of a strategic label given to certain things to ascribe certain kinds of value to them either within the art market or economy or institutional contexts and um, art, you're calling, like debating the line between art and non-art is sort of theoretically interesting but never is going to get you anywhere um, in particular. Um, and, you know, um, so much of what is like, you know, the logic of, say, the modernist avant-garde of the 20th century was that they proceeded through contradiction, you know, like each successive movement kind of rejected the norms and conventions of the previous ones or tried to position itself as non-art critiquing, you know, the previous generation of art and then gets subsumed into this um, thing that people call art. So I think, um, you know, when someone looks at um, an image and says, that's not art, you know, um, they have already pre-digested the fact that it might be. <laughs> Otherwise, why would you bother even saying that? Um, so that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's, um, 
you know, a kind of a rhetorical construct to an extent. And I don't think we need to debate the boundaries of art, but we do need to um, keep a, a sort of rather analytical and clear-eyed sense of these technologies and try to understand that the politics and the aesthetics sort of are entangled uh, and that we can recognise one in the other. Um, we've got time for, I think, one final round of responses from each of us. And I thought I would take us back to our questions that we kind of have posed to you, but also to ourselves, and ask that each of us respond to one of these, whether it's a call to action or a call for more further conversations. Um, and I am going to address the top question around how institutions like universities, but I think I'm going to take institutions broadly as also encompassing arts and cultural spaces. Um, and this morning I was reading that the Smithsonian Institutes had released an AI values statement, which I think is a, is a kind of fascinating space for them to be playing in. Uh, but I think it also speaks to um, the divide in conversations around these issues and the conversations that we have been having over the last few days and the conversations that are happening in arts and cultural institutions. And I flag this because the AI value statement that the Smithsonian has published starts by saying that they seek to only begin AI projects that implement tools and algorithms that are respectful to the individuals and communities that are represented by the information in their museum, library and archival collections. Which like lovely, lovely value statement, but also like how? How on earth are you going to do that? What training data sets do you know are going into it and how are you going to mitigate against that? I think that kind of response is lovely but not helpful and doesn't set us up for a roadmap. And so my response to this question is that it requires frameworks that work across sectors uh, and that our collecting institutions that hold our cultural content need to be included and brought along on these questions, on these conversations, uh, because how we look after and automate our cultural heritage is how we tell stories about the future. So I would call for more collaboration, more conversations cross-sectorally, please. Joel, do you have a response? Well, I think there should be an, um, an art and automation group at ADMS. And if, you know, anyone wants to, you know, talk about that, then they should get in touch. Um, and some of us have been talking about it for a while. Um, and I think something like an artist in residence program at the centre, um, where artists come in as associate investigators, um, work with people in the centre who are interested in this kind of stuff, get involved with things like exhibition making and performance, um, that that's going to be a really good way um, to take some of this research and kind of experiment with this feedback loop between research and practice um, in public spaces and institutional contexts where people um, are very open to um, encountering new kinds of work and where the discourses around you know contemporary art and theory and criticism can start to um, intersect more with what's happening in the centre. I see that as super valuable so I'm going to try to work towards things like that happening and hope others will you know join and be part of that too. Um, well <laughs> I, um, it's an easy answer for me. <laughs> Art is very valuable <laughs> um, in my discipline. Um, I mean, it's, it's my whole life, it's my community. I, the only thing I can really say about it is I wish that other disciplines valued it more. And I think it is really important and I think it's great that we're sitting here and having these discussions in a conference like this. It's great to be able to share our thoughts um, and where we're coming from. So I hope that it was useful to you as well. Thank you so much. We'll leave it there.